A lot of times in relationships, I think people are more active in trying to make the other person feel better mm -hmm. or stop feeling yeah. bad. And when somebody's in pain and somebody else is trying to do that, that is, it can be terribly invalidating and it can create distance. So one of the things that I work on with lots and lots of couples is tolerance mm -hmm. of your partner's emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, nobody wakes up in the morning and go, oh, I, I hope I feel really sad today. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> or I hope I feel really frustrated with my partner uh -huh. today, or whatever the case is. Yeah. I am so excited to interview Dr. Mike today. And on Embracing the Journey, you specialize in individual and couples and marriage counseling, so a lot of relationship stuff probably, but Absolutely. also executives and professionals. That's right. who don't necessarily have a diagnosis, but need somebody to kind of help them on this mental health journey, embrace the journey, we're yeah. all on it, whether yeah. we admit it or not. <laughs> right. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Pro start professionally, like your credentials and things like that. Sure, so Dr. Mike Golly, and I'm the owner of Ink Therapy. I work with individual and couples primarily, mm -hmm. uh, adults, no kids. Actually, when I started my career, I thought I was going to work with children and families. Uh -huh. And I started doing some of that work on internships and practicum. And, and I kind of went, I stink at this. <laughs> and, and I, I well, came... Well, thank you for doing that self-reflection <laughs> and not saying right. you can do everything. And, you know, I think it was because I developed um, a pretty strong cognitive approach mm -hmm. and like to really think intellectually and, and try and meet people at that intellectual level. Mm -hmm. And and that didn't work very well with kids. <laughs> with kids. Or, or I didn't know how to adjust Just, to right. make it work well with kids is uh -huh. probably a better way to say it. I'm a licensed psychologist. And when I went to college, I thought I was going to be a sportscaster. I went to University of Missouri because they have a very good journalism school. Mm -hmm. And then I realized about three weeks in that I kind of despise the media. I don't know that they do a lot to really help society. Mm -hmm. I had an inborn love of communication. Um, and so and that's, sports. that's why, and sports. Okay. And so that's why I went that way. Yeah, I kind of, I'd watch a game and naturally just do a play by play as I was watching. Mm -hmm. But I realized that, that I wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that that was going to be the way to do it. I remember calling my mom and, and she said, let me get this straight. You move 600 miles away to not study journalism? <laughs> If you want to look at it that way, I guess that's that's probably true. And so then I took a psychology course at some point, mm -hmm. and I went, I think this is it. Yeah. This is the way that I can fulfill my love of communication and actually help people. And then that eventually led to my first stint in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I got a master's degree at C up in Greeley. Okay. Um, and then my wife and I were thinking about starting a family. Most of our families more towards the East Coast. So we ended up in Gainesville. There's a ridiculous idea that we were going to move to Gainesville and then I was going to apply and get into a doctorate program. Mm -hmm. Terrible plan, <laughs> but it worked out. Okay. Um, not an easy school to get into. Not an yeah. easy school to get yeah. into. And I knew at that point that I wanted to do clinical work. Mm -hmm. UF is a research one institution and it and I was very honest. I have no intention of pursuing a research career. It almost kept me out of the program. I was mm -hmm. an alternate. And, yeah. But I told them, I'll, I will work as hard at the research as I do at the mm -hmm. rest of it. I'm really thankful that I went to that school. And then I worked at university but at first, mm -hmm. and then FGCU, you're probably familiar. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not. You went, You were at FIU, I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's in Fort Myers. Oh, oh, yes, yes, at the Gulf um, Coast, yep. Yep. Okay. The joke is it's Florida Golf Course <laughs> University. They do have a PGA program, so it's not. Yeah. And so I was there for about 12 years. The last mm -hmm. four, I was the clinical director there. Mm -hmm. um, and so a wide range of presenting issues and um, histories and backgrounds and cultures. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere in that time frame, well, I can tell you exactly, it was about 2012, um, I joined a group practice and really got to engage much more in couples work, mm -hmm. which is what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, 
few and far between at a university that there's couples coming right, in. Right. And so in 2020, already a weird year, the end of that year, my father passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, ever since we had left Colorado, my wife and I really missed it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things like that tend to change your perspective on the world. We said, right. what are we waiting for? Right. Um, so we moved to Colorado Springs for the first about six months. I was working uh, at a local uh, practice doing evaluations, psychological mm -hmm. evaluations, mm -hmm. which I had the skill set for, right. um, but it wasn't what really got me going. I would have clients who at the end of the evaluation, I'd go through recommendations. If one of those recommendations was counseling, um, many, many times they'd say, hey, can I work with you? And I'd have to go, no, mm. sorry. And so um, it was a, a difficult decision to walk away from that. Of course, I had to get my wife on board, mm -hmm. um, but I opened my private practice um, in 2022. Mm -hmm early in 2022, so a little so over two years old. Let's dive into the grief a little bit. Yeah. Um, turning point for you, I think grief is a yeah. turning point that you mentioned for a lot of people. Absolutely. Um, as a professional, you have all this education, you have all this experience, and then it happens to you. Yeah. Um, how do you think you approached it differently and what kinds of things were you more aware of than maybe someone who didn't have the education and experience? You know, I don't know that it would make me more aware um, other than the fact of the importance of talking about how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, maybe we'll get into that later yeah. about how society doesn't teach us oh, yeah, very yeah. well to, to deal with emotions. Especially men and especially men especially in sports. Especially men. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I knew about that, but um, my, my only other physical loss or human loss Mm -hmm. If you want to put it that way, it was my grandfather when I was eight years old and um, certainly not well equipped to navigate that at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew I would need to talk about how I felt. And there was a moment, uh, my, my dad had a stroke, um, mm -hmm. pretty much wiped out the entire left side of his brain. Mm -hmm. And we were going to go visit for the last time. And we knew it was the last time the next day. And we were sitting around the dinner table, um, my wife and three kids. And she said, you know, what do you need? What will you need from us tomorrow? And I went, I have no idea. And I thought about it for a minute. And I said, you know, I think I just might need some hugs. And um, during that day, during that visit, my son, my oldest son, who was probably uh, three years ago, he was 16 at the time. Mm -hmm. He must have came up five times and just gave me a hug. <laughs> during that time, yeah. no words, just came up and gave me a hug. Um, and I think my, not, it, and it didn't have anything to do with my professional training, it had mm -hmm. more to do with my experience of working with people. Mm -hmm. I knew that I needed to absorb that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, some of it does because I think most people would say nothing, I don't, I don't, nothing, or I don't know what I need, right? And it leaves people wanting to help and not being able to help. Yeah. Um, but your ability to, you know what, I, I actually don't know, but I, uh, some connection yeah. would be good, yeah. right? Um, so I think subconsciously you, you were able to communicate something that a lot of people aren't able to communicate. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's fair. And, yeah. and I think you know, when people are hurting, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times what they really need is comfort. And mm -hmm. you know, I think about, I work with a lot of people and they, and they don't know, they can't verbalize mm -hmm. what's comforting to them. Right. And so I'll, I'll say, well, think about when you were a kid mm -hmm. and when you fell and hurt, what did you seek out? Mm -hmm. Right? And of course, a lot of times it's mom or it's a hug or mm -hmm. it's ice cream or, you know, did but you it gives us an idea. Did you see with this football player um, jumped in the stands and uh, no. his mother was hugging him? Uh -uh. Gosh, I, I don't know the name of the football player, but it's okay. all over the news right now. Um, it, it's a, a college player, last game, they lost and he jumped up into the stands and his mom was there 
and he thought he was just going to give his mom like a hug. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as his mom gave him that hug, he began to cry. Mm -hmm. And so it's like all over the news. And um, instead of being embarrassed by it, he's like standing up and like, it's okay for men to cry. It's okay yeah. to, you know, get a hug from your mom yeah. when you lose a game. Yeah. And it was bigger than just losing a game. It was like probably his last game because he's not, you know, probably going to make the NFL, you know, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I thought it was very moving and kind of what we talked about of men, masculine yeah. energy, men yeah. feel like that emotions is more of a fem feminine quality and how do you maintain masculinity and still be able to express emotions. And, and I think even beyond that, it, yeah. it, certainly I think men get that message mm -hmm. more strongly, yeah. more overtly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all human beings get that message mm. from society as we go. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting to me as a therapist, mm -hmm. when people are in my office and they start to cry, what's the first thing that they say to me? Sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows, <laughs> everybody knows the answer to that question. Yeah. And I'm going, you know, look, I got Kleenex, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trained, <laughs> I'm ready, I can handle, and, and yet that is always the response. Yeah. And, and we get those messages in such subtle ways, mm -hmm. right? You know, if I start crying, somebody's, oh, it's okay, don't cry, which mm -hmm. sounds very sweet, but really <laughs> it's giving me the message, like, that makes me uncomfortable, right. put that away. And so um, a lot of clients are a little bit taken aback when mm -hmm. I say, you know, it's okay, or I'm more interested in what are those tears expressing, mm -hmm. not whether they're coming out or not, mm -hmm. not whether you are emotional or not, but mm -hmm. what is coming up and what is coming out. Um, and I think that that's such a huge part of maintaining mental strength or rebuilding yeah. mental strength um, and embracing the journey mm -hmm. of we are human beings, yeah. right? One thing every human being <laughs> has done is cry. Yeah. And yet we get that message that we ought not to do that and people apologize for yeah. it. Yeah. And grief is a, a common, I mean, everyone is going to experience grief, mm -hmm. um, some more intensely and in what seems out of order mm -hmm. as far as, you know, losing a child or a spouse or, mm -hmm. um, can we go back to how did you feel um, when this was going on with your father, mm -hmm. both when you knew it was about to happen mm -hmm. and then the three months to year after? Yeah, it was initially a bit shocking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, he was, he was 86, mm -hmm. so it's not out of order in right. that sense. Um, but he had been relatively healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about that, right? It's, we have some awareness mm -hmm. that life is not permanent mm -hmm. on this planet, um, but I don't know that we think about when that time's gonna come right. until something happens. And so he had that stroke and it, it really was shocking. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that there was some hope for a while Okay, he's going to recover. They, mm -hmm. you know, they he stabilized. They, um, but we had to go to the hospital and um, make a decision because he was on life-sustaining support, and and that was a very difficult decision. Which is a different type of grief. Yeah. Now that it's there's a little bit of um, responsibility on absolutely that, that pressure. Yeah. How do you make that decision? Yeah. That that is not my role. Is <laughs> when somebody's life ends right. um, but we were talking to the the neurologist and I said what does the recovery look like here what what's you know best case scenario and when she told us that the best case scenario included him needing help going to the bathroom for the rest of his life that you know I knew that he didn't, he didn't want, want that. that most people don't want that but I yeah. knew he did not want that and so that made that decision crystal clear. Mm -hmm. and, and he would have to learn to speak again. Mm -hmm. And there, there was so much to it. So that was the end of hope, but it sent us down a different path. Mm -hmm. And um, hospice came into the home. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was really about feeling an urgency to say what I needed to say 
and 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 at that point I knew that that was for me because I knew he couldn't understand what was being said in this um, earth on this earth and maybe <laughs> his soul and maybe his mm-hmm. spirit could mm-hmm. absorb that and yeah. and I had to trust in that um, but I also knew that I needed to say some things to say goodbye for me um, and then so that that was yeah. that last day that we were there and um, and that was that was hard yeah. you know it's um, they say about therapy that it's a unique situation because you can you can be intentional and plan out how you say goodbye mm-hmm. and you know in in this sense I got that same opportunity mm-hmm. um, and so the weeks and months after were complicated by the fact that I was the executor of his estate mm-hmm. and um, and you know that's a story for another time <laughs> um, but but oftentimes in grief there's some stressors you know I was yeah. uh, speaking to a patient recently who she lost her husband and it was not just about the grief like she was about to lose the house yeah like he was the financial person like yeah. there was so many other losses that she was experiencing that were urgent that she couldn't actually take the time to feel the emotional pain of losing her spouse. Well, and I think sometimes it's a mixed blessing, yeah. right? It, it, it distracts us in both positive and negative mm-hmm. ways. It gives us sometimes a sense that we're doing something to move, to mm-hmm. move, um, and not just sitting in that place of grief. And it, at, the, mm-hmm. uh, at the same time, it, it distracts us mm-hmm. from being able to feel mm-hmm. that. And of course, a lot of people don't necessarily want to feel that or don't realize the value in feeling mm-hmm. their feelings. Yeah, you gotta feel to heal, mm-hmm. like that. which is not a, a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. We don't think about that. We, we think of healing as fix, like just fix it. Right, yeah. But you have to feel that pain in order for it to decrease in intensity. Is, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and oftentimes finding ways to express that pain right to to get it out in some way words art um those are the two main ways that come to my mind but Uh um and do you use personally use art what do you do so i play music okay Um, which is a form of art mm -hmm. it's also a vibration that causes movement yes Um, i think music touches the soul for a lot of people and that's that's the case for me and so um whether it's writing music myself or Mm -hmm. listening to music that matches or that helps me express Mm -hmm. when I have a hard time finding the words myself. At what point in your life did you realize that that was your, what filled your cup? (sighs) Early probably. Okay. I've, um, because I think that that's a lot of people where they have problems in, in moving along in their journey is they, they haven't found what fills their cup. Yeah. Um, somebody will say, oh, do this, and it doesn't work for them. Right. You know, like my, the example I love to give is people are like, oh, just, you know, learn to run. Running is this great therapy. So for people that that works for, it is. Running is a, a great release for me. I hate running. Yeah. And so it was not therapeutic for me at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so finding, you know, what, what fills your cup. Yeah, um, is super important, and so I think you know I like to talk to men about that because I, I think women are more urgently trying to find it because yeah. they, the, the emotions are on the surface and they're trying to manage mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. but men feel like they're managing them by um, ignoring them yeah. or stuffing them down. Yeah. Or... So what are some other um, you know tips that you give people as they're trying to find what fills their cup? You know, I think um, I use the language, "What makes you feel alive." Right, mm-hmm. which isn't always the same as filling your cup, mm-hmm. but it's a good direction yeah. to get you started um, because it helps you get in touch with, I think, both the positive and negative. Mm-hmm. You know, the the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it it helps cover that range. And I knew pretty early on that music was a thing for me. I love to sing. Mm-hmm. It's one of the times I feel most alive in my life. And so it, it was sort of a natural thing for me to, to turn to. I think people who don't have that natural thing or haven't identified that thing mm-hmm. for them yet, which is probably complicated by the messages society gives us about right. emotion. Yep. Um, it can be frustrating yeah. to, to search and... You know, journaling is a thing that therapists recommend mm-hmm. a lot, and some people love it. And some 
I was watching the Olympics <laughs> and some of the gymnasts yeah. would journal as yeah, a way yeah. of helping them prepare and mm -hmm. giving themselves positive messages. Some people, yeah. it just doesn't do much for. It feels inauthentic, it feels contrived, and, mm -hmm. and so it doesn't fill that. Right. But I think you gotta try a few things. Yeah. I think also you have to know, what's what are we going for here, right? Music, journaling, it's not to take the feelings away. Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost to feel them. The opposite. <laughs> You got to feel to heal. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you see, I see this in sports a lot when someone does find a, a sport that helps them, and then they get an injury, and then they they don't have a plan B right. and things mentally. I mean, you you've seen this with some professional boxers and things like this when when they're unable to do what they're good at, um, you know, or even a runner who then breaks their ankle and can't run for you know three to six months. Yeah. Um, what happens to that mental health? So having kind of multiple um, avenues that, that right. release that. You know, in those situations, not only is it a, a grief, they're losing something that they love, mm. um, it's an identity issue for, yeah. for some people, right? I am a athlete, right. I am a runner, I, whatever the yeah. case is. And then they lose that and they're like, I don't know what mm -hmm. else I am. Um, yeah, that happened with my husband, I think, a mm -hmm. lot. Um, he, We moved here in 2013 to try to save our children with cannabis because okay. it was not legal in Florida at the time. Yeah, And he was working, teaching, and coaching football. And even though there were signs of the neurological condition going on, football is his bad. He was a football coach. He mm -hmm. played football in college. He was a football coach. Like, that was his identity. And mm -hmm. moving here... He was unable to get a job because the disability was a little, it was obvious and yeah. I think there was some discrimination there. Oh. And um, he went to the neurologist to try to get a letter saying, you know, you can work and that this is, and the neurologist said you need to retire. Oh. Um, so based on his brain scans and, and things like that. And so, um, I mean, it was almost a 10 year process, but you know, there was definitely, um, you know, an identity thing about he'd always been an athlete and now he, you know, then it was in a wheelchair and kind of progressing like that. And he knew he did not want to um, be taken care of as far as mm. you know, going to the bathroom and things like mm -hmm. that. And so as it got closer to that, you know, things progressed faster. And, yeah. But yeah, losing that identity um, is hard. It is. And it's, so that's what I was saying. Like everybody experiences grief. Mm -hmm. uh, one of um, my favorite, uh, um, you know, like a review from someone, because a lot of times people think, gosh, she, her grief is so big, I don't even either want to watch that or um, I can't learn anything from it or I feel okay. guilty for, for having grief, right? Okay. Um, yeah. But this one person talked about, like, her grief, she didn't lose her children, but her children, her adult children were making decisions that were not in line with how she was hoping, yeah. you know, yep. they would be, right? And um, yeah. that is grief. It's you know, a loss of to, an image or a dream or, yeah, yeah an yeah. expectation. So, you know, even mothers of disabled children or just, yeah. there's so many things that we grieve in life. Um, Absolutely. You know, so. Yeah. Any other tips on grief and how that impacts relationships? Because I know you do a lot of relationship counseling. Yeah, so... Um, one of the ways it impacts relationships is as hard as it is for me as an individual to um, allow myself to feel my feelings, to allow that to be okay, to not rush to try and get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, in, in general terms, it's even harder for me to see somebody I love feeling hurt, mm. feeling pain, and allowing them to have that. and and not want to take that away from them mm -hmm. or get upset that, mm -hmm. you know, this is going on too long or, you know, now your mood or your, your emotional state's impacting me mm -hmm. or just, just the, the, the simple fact of seeing somebody else in pain. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times in relationships, I think people are more active in trying to make the other person feel better. Mm -hmm. or stop feeling yeah. bad. Yeah. You want to take away the pain. Fix it. Everyone, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Fix it. Um, mm -hmm. And when somebody's in pain and somebody else is trying to do that, that is, it can be terribly invalidating. 
and it can create distance. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the things that I work on with lots and lots of couples is tolerance mm -hmm. of your partner's emotions. Mm -hmm. um, nobody wakes up in the morning and go, oh, I, I hope I feel really sad today. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> or I hope I feel really frustrated with my partner uh -huh. today, or whatever the case is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think with grief, there's a little bit more tolerance around that mm -hmm. at the outset, right? Right. Well, we expect somebody to feel sad when yeah. there's loss. Um, but when that doesn't resolve on some time frame that other people think is appropriate, mm -hmm. yep. um, then it becomes problematic. And um, that can lead to, you know, distance. It can lead to um, resentment. It can lead to one of the biggest... Um, downfalls of marriages is the loss of friendship and when one person is going through a significant emotional journey that the other person cannot will not tolerate accept or understand it yeah. creates that gap yeah and so that's probably one of the main things that i that i teach or work on with the couples that i work with yeah. is how do we number one identify label express how we feel mm -hmm. and, and express what we need like and express what, what we need what you were able to say yeah I, you know i just need some hugs yeah um, and the other thing and, and we talked about this a little bit offline before of this like taking responsibility for your own journey yeah of, you know your mental health and your mental strength yeah and i think in relationship we want the other person to rescue us we want mm -hmm. and i'm guilty of this too you know mm -hmm. like my you know like why why aren't you helping me you know right. Um, you are my person, you're supposed to be helping me. And um, so I think there's some of that wanting to be rescued from our pain. Yeah. Um, and in grief, we, we have to feel this pain and only we can feel it. Like um, people reach out to me who have lost a child and they're like, you know, what do I do? Tell me what to do. And it's like, I can help guide you, right? But you have to to feel the pain no one else can do that Absolutely. for you um and and sometimes that is taking time uh alone to do that yeah. and um and knowing that you know especially in intense grief it is going to likely be a lifetime yeah of you know but intermittently finding that joy and yeah and things like that so talk to me a little bit about your approach on that personal responsibility in their journey yeah, so um, it, it becomes very nuanced mm -hmm. with, you know, when you have um, a romantic relationship that's, you know, that started as a friendship and turned into a romantic relationship and then turned into a roommate situation and a, <laughs> and a you know, parenting partnership and a right. financial partnership and all of those layers that, that become a part of our marriages or relationships. Mm -hmm. um, because we do tend to walk that journey in so many ways with another person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think when we are looking to somebody else to help us feel better, mm -hmm. to rescue us, um, really what we're wanting is for somebody to just bear witness to our pain. Mm -hmm. so validate that, it. Validate Not it. validate it like you were talking about So before. that we can have that space so that we don't have to defend the pain that we're feeling. Um, quick story, if you don't yes, mind. Yes, absolutely. Love stories. Um, so this was years ago and I was driving home from work and um, I called my wife and she's crying. And I said, what's wrong? And she said that she was making dinner for the kids and dropped the bowl of pasta. And, mm -hmm. and I knew that she had been having a bad day. So that mm -hmm. was sort of the straw that broke the right. camel's back. But I said, I'll be home in 10 minutes. And so I got home and I walk in the door and the kids are walking around in a daze. They don't know what to do. And, you know, I walk in the kitchen and it must have been a terrific explosion because there was bowl and <laughs> pasta and sauce everywhere. I said, you know, where's my wife? And I walk around and I see her sitting on the floor leaning back against the cabinets crying. Mm -hmm. And there may have been a day or a time, there may still be, I'm not, I'm not perfect by any means, that I might have been bothered by that. You know, oh, I work hard all day and this is what I come home to. Mm -hmm. Or or I would have tried to convince, it's not a big deal, what, mm -hmm. you know. But on this day, I got it. Mm -hmm. And I, I went over and I knelt down beside her and I just sat there for a minute. And at some point, I put my hand on her knee and I said, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. A couple minutes later, I said, um, I'm going to go 
clean this up and finish making dinner for the kids. Mm -hmm. And I got up, walked away. She eventually went in the other room, came back in about 10 minutes and said, thank you, that's exactly what, what I needed. You needed. Yeah. And at the time I went, what I do? Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. All I did was bear witness to her pain and allow that to be okay, okay. in that moment so yeah. that she could move through it. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that learning what to ask of our partner mm -hmm. can be as simple as that, is just be with me yeah. in that time, mm -hmm. you know? Um, what's comforting, a touch, words, it's gonna be okay. Yeah. And then I can take that space. And I think that's where the personal responsibility comes in, mm -hmm. is I can allow myself to take that space. Mm -hmm. um, I know that my community, that my village, that my people can hold down the fort or, mm -hmm. you know, maintain what needs to be maintained so yeah. I can take that space. But I have to be willing to do that mm -hmm. and allow myself to feel to heal. Yeah. And yeah. so... And being aware of what triggers you, you know, I can tell you uh, the biggest fights in my marriage um, after losing children was like... I'm depressed and you're not fixing it for me, right? Mm -hmm. But really, because I work, I'm working on myself, I'm doing the work, I'm, I'm on that journey, I'm able to see, I'm really actually jealous that you don't wake up depressed every day. And mm -hmm. I think, and I, you know, I <clears throat> say, well, you're not grieving. Of course he's grieving, right? Um, but he wasn't predisposed to actual depression, right? And so he wasn't experiencing it the same. Mm -hmm. But I had enough insight to, like, I'm just jealous. And I, you know, he's actually dealing with the same neurodegenerative condition, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, and so having that insight of how you're contributing to the fights or the, the times that it doesn't go mm -hmm. well and, uh, and those kinds of things I think is is super important. And I love how you focus on not just communication, but how that those words, those actions are impacting your partner. Right. I love that. You know, and, and helping them recognize that language matters. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the example that you just gave is yeah. an interesting one um, because you didn't actually want him to wake up depressed right. every day, <laughs> right? Um, but you were most likely just seeking some some camaraderie, some mm -hmm. some shared experience right. with that, and not feeling alone right. in that. Um, but a lot of times when people mm -hmm. express how they feel, they don't actually express how they feel. Mm -hmm. They express a thought, and more often than not, especially you know when we're talking mm -hmm. about couples, that thought is an interpretation of the other person's behavior. So, for example, and, and I listen, and when I hear people say, I feel like, as soon as I hear like, mm -hmm. I'm aware you're about to tell me a thought, not a feeling. Mm -hmm. An example might be if I say, I feel like you don't like me. That's not a feeling. Right. That's an interpretation of your behavior. Mm -hmm. And a predictable response from you is to tell me why that's not true. Right. Right. Now we're arguing. <laughs> um, if I say... I feel unliked when I'm around you. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, the reaction mm -hmm. would be sort of a, more of a leaning in and going, mm -hmm. "Oh, tell me about that. Why?" Mm -hmm. You know. And so, not or only is it really, you know, it's actually an internal core belief that I'm not lovable and that you don't love me anymore. And you know, like right. if you keep all going that deep, stuff, yeah. <laughs> all those roots, absolutely, yeah. that that go. Everybody has them. Mm -hmm. That go pretty deep, and yeah, and create the lens through which we hear all of that yeah. through. Um, but teaching people how to, how to talk about their feelings, mm -hmm. right? Society teaches us not to express those things. Mm -hmm. And so we got to do a little work around that yeah. and, and learn or relearn how to do that effectively. Yeah. And by the way, I do not feel unlike that was just... <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so anything else you'd like to share? Um, um, especially to, you know... I think a lot of my followers are women. I have about 20% men. Um, and I think especially women have a hard time communicating to their spouse their needs yeah. because they feel like their needs aren't, sometimes feel like their needs aren't being met. Um, or if they think their husband needs to kind of embrace this journey a little bit. Um, how could a spouse gently, appropriately 
because it doesn't come out appropriately. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you need to see a counselor, something mm -hmm. wrong with you, right? Like that's how it, it ends up coming out in fights. But what would mm -hmm. be a good way for people to be able to, to have that conversation without it being an attack? Um, a lot of times what I'll tell people is to, mm -hmm. to really focus on how they feel mm -hmm. rather than what you're doing or not doing. Um, focus on how you're feeling and, and what you want to feel or, or what you need from your partner. Mm -hmm. um, because again, I think you're right. It, the level of frustration when we feel invalidated over mm -hmm. and over and over is hard to um, direct in gentle, positive, mm -hmm. encouraging ways and comes mm -hmm. out as attacks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there has to be a willingness. Uh, I tell a lot of couples that. I think if, if there's two things present, Mm -hmm. Willingness and capability, mm -hmm. you can be successful in this therapy mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's about really identifying, you know, what, what do we see as the roles in relation to each other? And recognizing where the personal responsibility comes mm -hmm. in. And are we, you know, putting undue expectations on the other person? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and communicating about those roles. I, I talk with couples about what I call meta communication, mm -hmm. communicating about communication, <laughs> right? Okay. We might have an argument and we can come back later when, you know, the, the intensity has died down and we're a little more level headed and go, you know, what went wrong mm -hmm. in our discussion? Yeah. Um, and, and so adjusting as we go in that sense by talking about the interactions that we've had that went well, the mm -hmm. ones that didn't. Um, but I think if we need to encourage our spouse to support us in different ways, mm -hmm. um, I, I sometimes will talk to people about a feedback sandwich. How do you <laughs> give difficult feedback to somebody? Mm -hmm. um, and so you start with pretty easily digestible piece. Mm -hmm. Right. I love you. I really value our relationship. And that's why I wanted to talk with you about this. Mm -hmm. Right. Then you put the, the difficult part in. in. <laughs> A lot of times I feel unsupported mm -hmm. or unheard or um, dismissed when I try and share with you what's going on with me. And then the easily digestible <laughs> piece to, to finish that. I like and that. and yeah. I, I would really, our relationship would benefit. You know, I will respect you even more than I do now if we can work together on right? something along mm -hmm. those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it is hard to mm -hmm. um, encourage somebody to interact differently with you to meet your needs mm -hmm. without them feeling attacked or blamed or... Yeah. And I always say, you've got to be on that journey. you got to look, yeah. look inward first. Yeah. You know, uh, let, you know, let's make some progress on your own journey before you start saying what's wrong with your partner and how they, sure. uh, you know, need to, to change or improve. Yeah. yeah. So. What I saw a quote on your wall downstairs, something like, um, in order to love yourself, you have to know yourself or is yeah. that, yeah. am I mm -hmm. quoting that accurately? Well, yeah. And you got to know yourself, like yourself mm -hmm. to love yourself. We always talk about, oh, self love and it's these things. And it's like, I, I realized as I, you know, I'd lost my children and I was approaching 50, I was like, I don't even know what fills my cup. I don't even know that piece about me. And I had to go on this little journey way too late, right? <laughs> like, you know, I should have figured that out in, in my 20s, but I was, you know, I'm a caregiver, so I do like caring for people. So yeah. that is one yeah. of the things that fills my cup and I can do that professionally. And so, you know, having kids, having a big family, taking care of my husband, right? Like, so I was filling my cup along the way. I just, I wasn't able to communicate it. I didn't know what, some of those things were. Yeah. I think that's a piece that for a lot of women or anybody mm -hmm. who has that caretaking tendency mm -hmm. or was taught to be a caretaker mm -hmm. can be hard about grief or emotion in general mm -hmm. is that there's sort of a, a belief that I have to make sure everybody, everybody else, else is okay. okay. Yep. And that can interfere. Mm -hmm. And so, um, really, really challenging that in yeah. times of need, like, mm -hmm. hey, it's okay for me to need something sometimes. Right, yeah. and I see this a lot with mothers who, you know, have, have lost a child and have living children, and they are struggling so much because they feel like they should be 
grateful and right. caretaking for their living children should be enough and um, but haven't taken the time to feel that pain and so just keep stuffing it down, stuffing it down. I think that's another piece of the emotional challenge we have in our society is mm -hmm. that a lot of times we expect other people to feel one way or the other. <laughs> Every, right? Well, yeah, and we live in a bipolar world ex for sure. Exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. You, as though you cannot be grateful that you have these children who are living and thriving mm -hmm. and, and be sad and grieving that right. you lost a child. Right, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. This was a very good conversation. We will have your contact information, your website, in the description of the YouTube channel. But Excellent. just uh, tell people how um, how to contact you and sure. uh, what kind of happens in that first um, yep. call and visit. Absolutely. So people can visit the website. It's inctherapy.org. Um, if you're interested in scheduling a consultation, I do offer free telephone consultations. Um, so we can talk about what the needs are and you can get a sense of whether we'd be a good fit to work together therapeutically. Uh, you can schedule that consultation right through the website. Um, you can always email me at info at inctherapy.org or call me directly at 719-500-1831. I'm quite accessible and I'm quite responsive to communication, so I'll get back to you rather quickly. So thank you for Perfect. the opportunity yes, to chat so today. I've yeah. enjoyed it quite a bit. Good.